Hello everyone and welcome to DNALC Live. My name is Sharon Pepinella and I'm excited to bring to you today the first of a three-part series where we're going to be looking at DNA barcoding and specifically the wet lab behind DNA barcoding. So going through the DNA isolation, amplification, and sequencing that can potentially allow us to identify different species. So I'd like to start my talk today by talking about the classification of living things. So different living organisms are organized into different groups based on shared characteristics. So this makes classifying organisms, it makes it easier for scientists to study them when we classify them this way. And taxonomy is the branch of science that is traditionally involved with identifying and classifying these different organisms. And taxonomists are also responsible for assigning different organisms a scientific name. So what is a scientific name? It's also referred to as by nomenclature, okay? And this is a formal system of naming all living organisms and giving each of them a name that's composed of two parts. I'll come back to that two parts in just a moment do this? Why do we assign a scientific name as opposed to just using something like a common name? Well, scientists agree upon this widespread naming because common names can be very misleading or unique. Okay, So if we look at the top two pictures I have on my screen here, on the left-hand side is a red panda. On the right-hand side is a panda bear or a giant panda. Now, these are both named panda, and they do share some characteristics, such as they take to Asia, they have a diet that consists primarily of bamboo. But in fact, both of these uh, organisms, both of these species here, come from two separate families. And even the red panda, as some scientists argue that, in fact, it's more closely related to a raccoon than it is to a panda bear. So the panda in their names can be a little bit mis misleading. Excuse me. On the bottom, I have another example. So on the left-hand side, I have the American robin. On the right-hand side, I have the European robin. Again, they're both named robin because some shared characteristics, such as that orange breast that you can see in both pictures. But again, both robins here, they're not closely related to each other at all. So that leads us to developing a scientific name to classify these different organisms. So where does the scientific name come from? How do we classify living organisms? Well, the classification tends to begin very broad. So we start at what we call the kingdom level. There are six different kingdoms. There's animals, plants, protists, fungi, archaea bacteria, and eubacteria. And humans, we are a part animal kingdom, but we're part of this kingdom with a large number of other organisms, including dogs, including crocodiles, jellyfish. Uh, so we've got a lot of different types of organisms that are all classified as animals. So what we want to do is narrow down our, these different levels of classification until we get to groups of organisms that are closely related. So from kingdom, we get slightly more narrow by looking at the phylum. So humans are part of the chordate phylum, and these are animals that tend to have a backbone. We can get uh, smaller with the mass. So again, these are now chordates that have fur, and they have hair, and they have milk glands. And this will continue to narrow until we get to the genus and the species level. So humans are the genus Homo. There are other organisms that also fall within the genus Homo, such as uh, Homo erectus, okay, ancient humans. There is another group of ancient humans known as Homo neanderthalensis, so very commonly referred to as Neanderthals. The, both of these groups of organisms uh, fell within the Homo genus along with humans, okay? But humans, modern humans specifically, fall within the species of sapiens. So our scientific name, that two naming system, is comprised then of the genus and the species, giving us Homo sapiens, okay? In fact, some, a fun fact, the uh, scientific name that is actually most familiar to people is Tyrannosaurus rex. So Tyrannosaurus is the genus, and Rex is, in fact, the species. So I like to start most of my barcoding talks with this picture here. I ask you, 
how many different species are pictured. If we look at the different pictures here, we've got, it looks like some cauliflower, we've got some cabbage, maybe some radishes, some Brussels sprouts, some kale, maybe some kohlrabi in here. So how many species do you think are here? Well, I normally get an answer of somewhere between maybe six and 13, okay? And where do we come up with that answer? Well, based on what they look like, each of these organisms, while they have some shared characteristics, look very different from each other. So you might be surprised to find out that in fact, these are all one species, Brassica oleracea, okay? So, that's a little bit surprising because when we think of assigning different uh, species their scientific names, we make the assumption we often go based on morphology, so what they look like. So we have species that look very, very different, but in fact are very, very genetically similar to the point where they're, they're, they're the same species. So we can see already that classification of organisms can be very difficult. So why do all of these different organisms look different? Well, it has to do with the fact that they are different cultivars. And what that means is that each of these different cultivars have been selected for a specific trait that farmers have been selecting for over many, many, many years. So for example, uh, cauliflower from the original wild mustard here, it was selected for different flower clusters that now give us our cauliflower today. Kohlrabi was selected for the type of stem that it has. Brussels sprouts for the type of lateral buds. So genetically, they're very, very similar, okay? but phenotypically or their morphology, how they look is very different. So what is DNA barcode? Well, just as you have a unique pattern of bars in a universal product code or a UPC code that can identify a consumer product, so for example, you go to the supermarket, you grab a box of cereal, you bring it up to the counter, the cashier scans it, and that barcode will tell them that that product was Cheerios. So just like you can do that with a product, we can use a short region of DNA called a DNA barcode that's about 600 or so nucleotides in length, so relatively small. We can use that as a unique DNA sequence to potentially identify each living thing. So what I have here is a pictorial representation of 14 different species whose DNA barcode region has been aligned, so it's on top of each other. And what you're seeing is these four colored bars here represent each of the four DNA nucleotides, so A, T, C, or G, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And where you see the light gray regions, that's where the DNA between the different organisms agrees. So at that position in the DNA sequence, that nucleotide is the same. And where you see the colored bars, that's where it differs between organisms. So what we're looking at here is that we can make determinations about how related certain organisms are in their barcode region. So we can see this cluster of organisms here are very similar, this cluster of organisms here are very similar, and this cluster of organisms here are very similar to each other. So DNA barcoding allows us to compare different organisms, but we can also use the DNA sequence, so the composition of the A's, T's, C's, and G's within that DNA region to potentially identify the species. And I'll talk about that more in just a bit. So why is DNA barcoding important? Well, first of all, no one knows how many species there are. It's currently that there's about 1.6 million species that are described or known in the world. But in fact, this number may represent only a very small fraction of the true number of species, okay? especially when we start considering things like bacteria. There's 100 to 1,000 species per million that go extinct every single year. And perhaps more than a third of all species are threatened. Okay, so what this means is that we may be losing organisms and losing different species at a rate that is faster than we are able to identify them. So we are losing species that we never knew existed. And in fact, scientists say that we are currently in the sixth mass extinction event in the history of the world. There's also a lack of agreement as to what a species is. So defining a species can be very complex and depends on a number of different factors. But as I mentioned already, 
morphology is one that we tend to use to try to identify species. So let's use that example here. Let's take my two organisms that I have on the top. On the left hand side, I have a wolf. On the right hand side, I have a domesticated dog. Looking at these two organisms, would we assume that they are the same species? I probably wouldn't, right? Because they look, they have some shared characteristics, but they look very different. But in fact, they are the same species. Domesticated dogs are just a subspecies. So the species is Canis lupus. Domesticated dogs are Canis lupus familiaris. What that means is that there's some genetic distinguishing characteristics between the subspecies and the species, but they can interbreed and they can produce viable offspring, meaning offspring that can also reproduce. And interbreeding capabilities, again, is something else that scientists tend to use to describe a species. So already we can tell that morphology or what an organism looks like can be difficult in classifying a particular organism. How about here? I have another picture of two these two ducks look very different from each other. Would we say that they are the same species or different species? Well, in this case, these are in fact the same species. So why do these two look so different? Okay, Here, our dogs look very different because our domesticated dogs have been selected for desired traits over many, many years. Okay, But in this example, we can see where the male and the female look very different. And this is very common to have males and females look very different in different species. Why is that? Well, often the males tend to be very flashy to try to attract a mate. Females can often be uh, less flashy and they tend to blend into the background for protection purposes. So other things, we talked about interbreeding, we talked about morphology um, and how we define a species. Ecological context is important, so where organisms actually live. So you can have two different organisms that look very similar to each other, but they just simply grown up in separate but similar habitats, okay? So they've evolved to develop similar characteristics that allow them to best adapt to that habitat. So that's called convergent evolution, but in fact, those two species are not closely related. And then, of course, genetic similarities we are, uh, scientists are starting to look at now in defining what a species may be. So finally, traditional taxonomic identification methods may be inadequate or too slow to capture our vanishing biodiversity. So what do I mean by this? Well, take a look here. Can you identify species of organism? Well, we can probably make the assumption that it's some sort of insect, right? Although I guess it could be just a funny looking stick, but we'll say that these look like their legs here. It's got kind of this uh, raised hind leg here. So I would make the assumption that maybe it's some sort of grasshopper, right? Well, if we look at this, that's the best that I can do. I can say that maybe this is a grasshopper, but I certainly can't get anywhere near what species this might be. Additionally, I have no idea where this organism came from, which is another factor that we use to identify these organisms. So. It's difficult for people who are not trained taxonomists to be able to look at an organism like this and be able to identify the species. For anybody wondering, this in fact is the Mediterranean cone-headed grasshopper. Okay. Additionally, classic taxonomy is difficult experts to understand. So not only do non-experts not have the training, but if we try to use the same tools as taxonomists do to identify organisms, it can be very difficult. So if we take a look, this paragraph here contains all of the information that a taxonomist would use to identify this organism. And it contains words like hemispherical, integument, recumbent setae, maxilla, I can't pronounce that one. So yeah, there's a lot of language in here that it would be very difficult for the average person to use to try to describe different species or use this to identify a species. Other things that add to the complexity of identifying organisms, the fact that you have uh, immature organisms. So 
Adult organisms can be difficult enough to try to identify, but then we look at immature organisms. So for example, if you did not grow up knowing that a butterfly came from a caterpillar, you would think we were crazy, right? They look very, very different. But the immature version of the butterfly is the caterpillar and it looks very different. So identifying adults can be hard, identifying immature organisms can be even more difficult. It can also be difficult to identify an organism that has been damaged or an incomplete specimen as well. So all of these things can make it difficult or in fact impossible to use classic taxonomy to identify these organisms. So what DNA barcoding does is it takes something complex and somewhat objective and it makes it much more simple. So it turns into A's, T's, C's, and G's. And this makes it much more objective to compare this DNA sequence to other organisms to try to learn about their evolutionary relationships and what these organisms are. So how does DNA barcoding work? Well, it begins when we sample an organism. So we need a lot of the organism or a lot of the organism's tissue to be able to isolate the DNA from it. So for example, if we're working with maybe an invertebrate sample, you only need a small piece of a leg or maybe just a small part of the organism. If we have that we're working with. You only need something that's maybe the size of a hole punch uh, out of one of the leaves. So we don't need a lot of tissue at all. And in fact, what this does is it allows us to minimize our ecological footprint. So we're not going out and ripping up an entire environment trying to identify what it is. From getting the tissue sample, we can then extract the DNA. There are a number of different methods to do DNA isolation. I will be showing you a rapid method today. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other methods later. So we're gonna use a rapid method to isolate the DNA. And from there, we're going to look at one specific region of the DNA called the barcode region. So we don't need to look at all the DNA. In fact, that's a lot of information and it would be very costly to try to sequence all of the organism's DNA. So the barcode region is just enough DNA sequence with just enough variability for us to be able to make distinguishing or to distinguish between uh, different species. So we amplify this region using a process called PCR or polymerase chain reaction. And basically it's a method that allows us to make lots and lots and lots of copies of one particular region of DNA. We will talk more about PCR in the next episode. After the barcode region has been amplified and we have lots of copies of that barcode region, we then get the DNA sequence. Now the sequencing of the DNA is the only thing that we or our students tend not to do in house, simply because obtaining the DNA sequence is a lot faster and a lot cheaper for us to have done commercially. We can have DNA sequencing results back within a couple of days after the facility receives our uh, amplified DNA barcode. So that's the only thing we tend not to do, but once we receive the sequencing information, this specific barcode, we can then use that sequence information or use different databases or tools to analyze the sequence. One in particular that we use here at the DNA Learning Center is one uh, website that was actually developed by the DNA Learning Center in collaboration with a group called Cyverse, and that is DNA Subway. So DNA Subway is a bioinformatics tool that allows us to analyze the quality of our DNA sequence. It allows us to compare different sequences of different organisms. It allows us to identify the species by comparing the DNA sequence to a large database that contains sequence information from millions of organisms that have already been identified, which is how we can identify or potentially identify our species this way. And then there are other databases as well, as well that have DNA sequence information, such as the Barcode of Life database. So we can both use these databases to analyze and identify our species, but we can also use these databases to potentially publish our information and spread that knowledge with the scientific community. So how do scientists determine what region of the DNA makes a good barcode? Well, scientists tend to agree that a good barcode region has about 70% conservation. That means the DNA is similar enough that we can make lots and lots of copies of that, but it's different enough that there's enough ability within the DNA that we can use it to potentially identify between species. So scientists have looked at a lot of different regions of DNA and have settled on a few regions that we call 
universal barcode regions. So for plants, that tends to be the RBCL gene, also the Rubisco gene, as well as the MATK gene, the maturase K gene. Both of these have that about 70% conservation that we're looking for, and it falls within the chloroplast region of the plants. That's where those genes are. For animals, we look at CO1 or cytochrome oxidase 1, and this gene is found within the mitochondrial DNA. Okay? For organisms such as fungi or bacteria, we look in the nucleus. So fungi have regions that are referred to as internal transcribed spacer regions within the nucleus. Okay? And bacteria have the 16S rRNA gene that we look at within the nucleus. We'll focus primarily over the episodes on RBCL for plants and on CO1 for invertebrates. So this case study here, the Neotropical Skipper Butterfly case study, was one of the original uh, case studies that showed the value of DNA barcoding. So that focused on the Skipper Butterfly here, which was first in 1775. This tended to be a wide-ranging species. So scientists saw, thought that it ranged from southern United States to Argentina in South America. But while scientists were studying this butterfly, and you can see it up here on the right-hand side, it's a very pretty butterfly, they noticed a few things that were odd with regard to this species, one of which was the caterpillars that gave rise to this species looked very different from each other. And that was a little bit surprising that there would be such a variability in the caterpillars that all gave rise to the same species of butterfly. Another thing that was striking was the fact that these caterpillars had a very different diet. So they fed on very specific plants. And again, that's a little bit unusual to have that wide array of a diet for this organism that all gave rise to the same species. So what the scientists who published this paper did is they looked at about 500 or so samples that they collected from uh, natural history museums around the country, around the world. And what they found in looking at all of these samples using DNA barcoding, that in fact, there were 10 different species that were being described as one species. This paper was published in 2004. So you can see for quite a long time, these species were all being described as a single species when in fact barcoding in a relatively short amount of time identified that in fact these were 10 different species. But again, morphologically, the adult butterfly here looked very similar between all 10 of these species. Another thing that DNA barcoding can be used food fraud. So you may have heard of the Sushi Gate study. This was a study that was done by two high school students in New York City, where they went around to different markets and restaurants and collected a number of different sushi samples, 60 different samples. And they did DNA barcoding on these samples. Because of course, when the sushi samples are in their filleted form, they don't look like the original fish. So using classic taxonomy to try to identify them can be very difficult. So when these students looked at these 60 samples, they found that in fact, over 25% of the samples were mislabeled. And in each case, they were mislabeled as a type of fish that was more expensive than the fish that it actually was. So for example, tilapia was being marketed as white tuna. So that was a great example of how DNA barcoding can be used in cases like food fraud. There are a number of different projects that DNA barcoding with. I mentioned food fraud already with the sushi, but uh, people will frequently do food fraud looking at supplements because, again, remember, supplements are not regulated by the FDA. So sometimes they contain compounds in there that are not listed on the label or, in fact, contain any of the compound that they said that they're supposed to contain. We can use barcoding to monitor dis different disease vectors such as mosquitoes and ticks because, excuse me, different vectors can carry different types of diseases. We can use it to identify morphological doppelgangers. So organisms that look so close to each other, it's very hard to tell them apart. So can DNA barcoding be the tool that helps us to tell them apart? We can use it to establish biodiversity inventories. So going to a location and trying to establish or determine all of the biodiversity that is in that particular location. We can use it to combat poaching. This is actually being done now at certain airports.
where, uh, say, things like tusks are coming through that are being labeled as one thing, but in fact may come from animals that are illegal to hunt. We can use it to identify organisms that are difficult to track. So, for example, fish can be difficult to determine if they are in a particular location or when they arrive at that location. So DNA barcoding, we can use the water samples because these organisms shed their DNA into the water and use the presence of their DNA in the water to potentially identify the species there, that are there and the possible abundance of those species as well. We can determine unknown diets from organisms. So it could be an organism that is hard to track or one that is very small in number, so they're hard to find. So we can identify what they're eating by looking simply at their poop. You can think that the leaf that goes in that this organism is eating is not going to look the same as it comes out. So DNA barcoding can help us to identify what those specimens are. They can identify underdescribed life stages. As I mentioned, it can be really difficult to identify organisms that are immature or in the larval stage. So barcoding can do this, especially when it's important for scientists to be able to identify larval organisms very quickly and much, much more. Okay. Some advantages, other advantages of DNA barcoding, as I mentioned before, taxonomists are the ones that traditionally do the identification and classification of these organisms. Well, non-experts can do DNA barcoding to potentially identify these different organisms. In addition, they can ID incomplete, damaged, or processed samples. So we have fish here that has been filleted. In here, this is samples of Chinese medicine. There have been publications to show that traditional Chinese medicine samples are often mislabeled. So studies have been done using DNA barcoding to study uh, the mislabeled organisms and so on. And another advantage is publication. So of course, anything that we do, we want to make sure that people around the world have access to that information. So when we do DNA barcoding, we can contribute information to different species databases. So this includes uh, the sample database that the DNA Learning Center has up and running that we can um, put our different organisms into and in the locations where we found these different organisms and other species databases such as iNaturalist, which you might be familiar with. And of course, sequence databases. So we can publish our DNA sequence information to GenBank, especially if that information is what we call novel. So that sequence information for that particular organism has not been published before. We then identify it and publish it to GenBank and other databases such as the Barcode of Life database. So we want to make sure that all of this information is accessible because as I said earlier, we are having a hard time identifying these species and they're rapidly disappearing. So the faster we can disseminate that information, the better it's going to be for us to learn about these different species. And of course, learning is integrative across a number of different disciplines. So you're not just working in one scientific field here. We're looking at ecology and evolution. We're looking at cell and molecular biology. At genetics, we're doing biochemistry, we're doing bioinformatics and computational biology. So if you do DNA barcoding, especially as a research project, you're looking at all of these fundamental techniques in a broad number of fields. And there's, of course, a lot of questions that we're hoping to both answer barcoding and that we uh, are thinking about when we're doing DNA barcoding, such as what is a species? Can DNA barcoding help us to make a better determination as to what a species is? Can a DNA sequence, a barcode, identify a species to the species level? How many mutations DNA sequence might be a different species? Um, phylogenetic trees, so looking at comparisons between different organisms. How might they change when we look simply at their morphological characteristics or traits compared to when we look at their DNA sequences? So these are all questions that we are thinking about when we're doing, a bar doing DNA barcoding and hoping that we can answer. So what I'd like to do now is to the wet lab portion of today's episode where we're going to move forward and isolate DNA from some samples that we have. What I have for you up front here is I have a plant sample that you see here. And again, remember, we don't need a lot of tissue for this. We only need a very small amount of samples. So I just took one leaf from a plant that I don't know what the species is. Okay. And I also have a butterfly here. This butterfly was provided to me by my colleague, Jeffrey Petraka, who is the entomologist for the Long Island Aquarium. So he gave me this butterfly so we could potentially identify the species here as well.
Now, the first thing that we want to do is to get a small piece of tissue into one of my microfuge tubes so that we can begin the DNA isolation process. And again, we only need such a small, small amount. So what I'm going to use to remove tissue from my plant sample here is the back of a pipette tip. So this is our smallest set of pipette tips here. Generally, you don't want to touch pipette tips with your hands, but in this case, because I will be disposing the tip afterwards, it's okay. So we're going to use the small end. It's a very, very small hole. Again, if you're using, say, a hole punch to do this, you might want to punch it out and then cut it in half or cut it in quarters. The reason being, we don't need a lot of tissue because we don't want to have a lot of extracellular debris being brought through the DNA purification process. And we don't need a lot of DNA to begin with to get a lot of DNA barcode region later. Remember, our amplification will take care of that for us. So I'm going to use the back of a pipette to, to remove this plant sample. So we already have my microfuge tube set up here for my plant. I'm just gonna open my tube. Now, to get the plant sample, I'm gonna punch out a hole inside of my uh, tray here. And I'm gonna hold this leaf sample with my hands. Now, of course, in science, it is very important that we avoid cross-contamination. So I want to avoid all, as much as I can putting my DNA into any other sample. So why is it okay that I'm touching this plant sample today when we go to amplify this plant's barcode region? Well, if you said it's because we're looking at the RBCL region, which is found in chloroplast, that would be why. Do humans have chloroplasts? We do not, okay? So I don't have to worry about contaminating the sample with my DNA because we're not gonna be amplifying anything that would be in my human DNA. So I'm just gonna take this pipette tip, I'm gonna hold my leaf down here, okay? And I'm going to punch a small hole, best I can, Okay, out of my plant sample. And I'm just gonna pull off a little bit of that extra. So I just have that one small disc. And again, if you have trouble when you're doing your DNA isolations, you can use things like a tweezer, you can use other pipette tips, you can even use a razor blade if you like, that makes it easier for you. But I like to have a consistent size sample anytime I'm working with this. So now I'm going to place this small circular piece of tissue from my leaf into my tube that I already have labeled. And we'll just keep that closed and off to the side now. The other organism that I'm going to be isolating DNA from, like I said, is my, my butterfly. Now, is it a problem if I were to contaminate my butterfly here with my DNA? In fact, it is, okay? Because remember, the re barcode region that we use for amplification is cytochrome oxidase 1, CO1, and that is in the mitochondria. And of course, we as humans, we have mitochondria as well with that gene. So I do have to be careful about how I'm removing the tissue from this organism. So I'll be using a forceps here, and I'm just gonna be taking a small piece of tissue. When you're working with invertebrates, the best thing to do is usually take, especially if you've got like a spider or a mosquito or a butterfly, is to take a piece of the leg. You really don't need much more than that. If you have a really, really small organism, sometimes you wanna cut it in half. You always wanna cut it in half laterally so that you have um, a sy symmetry of the organism or the remains of the organism left behind because Barcoding and taxonomy will go hand in hand. So barcoding isn't necessarily trying to replace taxonomy. It's trying to be used as something to supplement taxonomy. So if we need to be able to identify our organism through taxonomic means as well, we want to make sure we have all of the pieces of the organism that could be important to identify it. So for example, I often have students that might cut off the head or cut off the abdomen um, of the, their organism that they're trying to identify. And then when we need to taxonomically identify it later, maybe the antenna was the important part. Part of the abdomen is the, the key characteristic that's used to differentiate between different species. So I wanna make sure that, so if you're working with small organisms, cut it down um, in half so that you have two symmetrical signs, okay? And then, or try not to use the whole organism at all. But if you have to, take really good pictures ahead of time, again, in case you need to do taxonomic identification. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna flip my butterfly over here, and I'm just gonna remove a small piece of its leg, okay? 
and you can see very pretty butterflies. So I'm excited to find out what kind of species this is. So I'm only touching the butterfly with my forceps. Okay. And of course, these butterflies uh, are not alive. We freeze all of our organisms. Okay. So I'm going to cut off with just a small piece of the leg right here. And I will place that leg inside of, again, the labeled tube. So as you can see, okay, it's again, just a small piece of, of leg here. Okay, we don't need a whole lot of tissue again. Okay. Now I'm going to continue the processing of my sample, specifically focus on my plant sample. I will do my invertebrate sample as well, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to move forward with the plant. But I'll have both samples when we move into next episode and we amplify the RBCL and the CO1 gene for both those organisms. So the first thing we want to do once we have our tissue inside of our tube is to start to break down the tissue so we can release the DNA as well as the other cellular components out into the environment. So we're going to do this in two ways. The first is through a chemical digestion. So I have here a tube that contains the solution guanidine hydrochloride. It's six molar guanidine hydrochloride. And guanidine hydrochloride is a mild acid. So when I add this to my sample, it's going to help to chemically break down these membranes and release the DNA into the environment so I can begin the DNA purification process. The amount of lysis solution that I want to add into my tube is 50 microliters. So if I were to take my lysis solution and just pour that right into my tube, would I get 50 microliters? It's unlikely. It'd be pretty impressive, but it's highly unlikely. So we need a scientific way to be able to accurately measure and transfer very specific volumes of liquid. And that's what we do with these micropipettes. So we have three different types of micropipettes in this lab that measure three different volumes. The one with the gray cap measures very small volumes of liquid from about half a microliter up to 10 microliters. To give you an idea of that volume, a melted snowflake is about two to three microliters in volume. So very small volumes with this. Our yellow pipette, which I will be using first, measures volumes of liquid from uh, 10 microliters up to 100 microliters. And of course, if I'm starting with 50 microliters, that falls within this range. So I'll be working with that pipette. And then lastly, our blue pipette measures the largest volumes of liquid here, which is 100 microliters to 1,000 microliters. Or 1,000 microliters is also one milliliter. To give you an idea of that volume, if you go to the doctor and you're sick and they kind of give you that gross pink liquid with a little cup on the cap, those measurements on that cup are in milliliters, okay? All right, so I'm going to start with my yellow pipette. And of course, as I mentioned before, cross-contamination we want to be very aware of. So we want to make sure that any solution I'm putting inside of my pipette is not mixing with any other solution that this pipette has come into contact with before. So that's the purpose of these pipette tips. We place them on the end of our pipette here, and that will keep all of our uh, samples sterile. To place a pipette tip on, you just simply tap it onto the edge of the box. Give it a couple gentle taps and you'll see that the pipette tip is on, okay? I want to set the correct volume and you'll see that there's a window in the front of the pipette. This window uh, for all of our pipettes has four numbers in it at all times. For my yellow pipette, you'll see that about three numbers down, there's a line that runs across the center of the window. And that number represents the decimal point. So the decimal point will help us to determine the volume that should be in my window. So if I want 50 microliters, 50 microliters in my window will look like 0, 050 0, decimal point zero. So that is the accurate volume. If you're holding a pipette, you just reach your hand like you're shaking hands with someone. Doesn't matter if you're right or left-handed, it works the same for both. Put the curved edge of the pipette over your fingers like so, curl your fingers around the pipette, and that gives you access to this plunger on the top with your thumb. When you press the plunger down, what you're doing is you're expelling this exact volume of air inside of here and creates essentially a vacuum inside of your pipette that allows you to then draw up a solution. So we'll press gently down to what I call the first stop. The first stop is what we use to measure the volume of liquid, but we can actually push further. If you push down harder, that's called the second stop. That gives an extra puff of air out of the pipetter. So when we're releasing our solution into a microfuge tube, we'll use the second stop. So 
I'm going to press to the first stop to go into my lysis solution tube. We want to do this before we go into the tube so we don't push bubbles into my lysis. Pressing to the first stop, placing the pipette tip into the tube, and I always hold the so that I can see the pipette tip inside of the tube. I want to make sure that I know exactly what's going on inside so I don't increase my chance of getting air bubbles. And to draw up my solution, I'm just going to slowly raise my thumb up off the plunger. And now, if I look inside of here, I have no bubbles. I have exactly, exactly 50 microliters inside of here. And I'm going to place that into the tube that contains my sample. So now, okay, now I want to, we've, like I said, the lysis solution is a chemical breakdown of the membrane, but I'm also going to help that along by mechanically breaking this down using a pestle. So pestles, which I have here, are sterile and are designed, you can see this tip here, it's designed to fit into the bottom of one of these microfuge tubes. So this will allow us to very easily crush our sample really well. So I'm going to take this pestle, I'm going to open my tube here, and I'm going to close my tips because I'm done with those for now. And I'm just going to place this on the table. And what I'm going to do is take my pestle and crush this sample using a lot of force, okay? So you want to do this pretty firmly. You don't want to just rapidly press the pestle up and down because you could potentially lose the lysis solution. But I really, really want to press this firmly and twist the pestle as I'm doing this because what that will do is it will break open that tissue along with the lysis solution that's helping to do that until I'm left with just very, very small tissue particles in here. And you can see okay, that if you look at the tube now, you can see here that the solution has started to turn green. So that's all of the chlorophyll starting to come out of the cells and into solution. And that's generally a pretty good indicator that you've successfully broken down the tissue inside of here. So we're done with the first step okay, of the DNA isolation. So now we're going to move on to the process of purifying the DNA. To do that, we want to bind the DNA to something so that we can remove the rest of the contaminants that are inside of here, this tube now. Because remember, it's not just the DNA that's in here, it's also the rest of the cellular debris. So what I have in this tray here are very, very small disks. These are Wattman, <coughs> excuse me, Wattman number one chromatography disks, okay? And these disks are made up of cellulose that helps to bind the DNA. And we don't need very large disks at all. And I'm going to transfer one of these disks into my tube here. And my hope is to have the DNA bind from, that I've now released into my lysis solution environment, bind to that Wattman disk. So I'm going to take one of these uh, pipette tips. And all I can do is pretty easy. You just have to stab one of the discs and place it into the tube. If you don't have pipette tips or you're more comfortable using a pair of forceps, you can do that as well. Just make sure that it's a clean pair of forceps. So you're going to press the disc onto the end of the pipette tip and place this directly into the solution. You want to make sure that the disc is fully submerged inside of the solution because it, we want it to bind to as much DNA as possible. So we're going to let that sit here for about a minute. So the longer it sits in here, the more DNA that it's going to bind. So in the meantime, let's talk about how the DNA is actually binding to this disc. And it has to do with a little bit of interesting chemistry. So our DNA molecule, which I have over here, so our DNA molecule, molecule has an overall charge anybody know what that is? Yes, okay, so the DNA molecule is negatively charged, and that's due to the phosphates that are in the backbone of my DNA. Now, as I mentioned, the Wattman chromatography disc, okay, is made up of cellulose, and cellulose provides that Wattman disc with an overall relatively negative charge as well. So would we expect the DNA to normally bind to that disc? We would not, right? Because two like charges should repel each other. So how is the DNA binding to this Wattman disk? Well, it has to do with something called a salt bridge. And a salt bridge is a combination of hydrogen bonds and electrostatic interactions between the DNA and the Wattman disk. So 
the guanidine hydrochloride that we have our sample currently sitting in actually provides the correct pH and the right ions to form a bridge between the negatively charged DNA and the negatively charged cellulose. It's not a very strong bridge, but it's enough to be able to bind the DNA through our purification process. And in fact, we don't want it to be a very strong bond. We don't want it to be a covalent bond because we need this process to be reversible. We need to be able to remove the DNA from that disk later so we have just the final purified DNA at the end, okay? All right, while I'm waiting for this to finish incubating inside of my tube, I need to now set up my wash buffer tube. So we're going to add 200 liters of wash buffer into my tube that I already have set up here. And we'll talk about the purpose of the wash buffer in just a moment. I'm doing 200 microliters. We need to now switch to my blue pipette, okay? And we're going to set this. There is no decimal point on this uh, window here. So 200 microliters is going to read 0200. So I'll use that dial to spin down to 0200. And we're going to use the largest set of pipette tips now to transfer my wash buffer solution. Now I have my wash buffer solution sitting on ice and this is very important. We'll talk about why in just a moment. So I tapped my pipette tip on again using the largest pipette tips that we have. And we're going to draw up 200 microliters of this wash buffer. Again, pressing down to the first stop drawing up 200 microliters, checking for bubbles, looks good. And we're transferring it now into my wash buffer tube. Pressing to that second stop, make sure all of my solution is out and we're good. Okay, so I want to transfer the disc that has been sitting inside of my tube now into my wash buffer solution. Again, that's going to start the purification process. This is pretty easy. All you need to do, again, you can either use a tweezer if you like. I prefer to use one of the thinner pipette tips. You're going to take your pipette tip and you're going to just drag the disc up the side of the tube. And what you want to do is try to avoid bringing any of the tissue that's remaining behind in solution along with the disc. You want the disc to be pretty clean at this step. So you can see here, I've got my disc on the side of my tube. Now this is probably the trickiest part of the entire experiment, which is where I need to transfer this tiny little disc into my wash buffer tube. The best way to do this is to just kind of hold the tube like so and gently slide my disc right into the wash buffer and toss my tip, and I'm now done with this solution. However, you can actually hold on to this lysis solution for a few days. There's more DNA in here, so if you want, you can actually keep it in the fridge for a couple of days and come back to this and use this to collect more DNA in the future. So now I have my disc sitting in the wash buffer solution, and I want to make sure I get any of the residual tissue off of this disc and to really agitate the discs so that I'm removing any contaminants that may have been brought along with the DNA. So this can include proteins, this can include polysaccharides, um, other types of carbohydrates. So we want to make sure all of this is being removed off of the disc. So we're just going to give this a flick, and you can, it's a pretty aggressive flick, but you want to make sure that the disc stays in solution. And you can see that some of those small pieces of tissue that came along with my disc are now coming off in solution. So I'm going to let this sit here in this disc for just a moment. Okay, so we'll set, let it sit for about a minute so that the wash buffer continues to purify. Okay, so what is the purpose of this wash step? Well, like I said, we want to remove all of these contaminants away from the DNA. So the DNA is bound to the disc through these salt bridges, but there can be other samples in here that are kind of non-specifically interacting with the disc, but not necessarily bound to it. So the wash buffer here is going to help remove all of those contaminants off of the disc. So why doesn't the DNA come off of the disc and uh, into the wash buffer? For two reasons. My wash buffer is made up primarily of ethanol and DNA does not dissolve inside of ethanol. In addition, I kept my sample here very, very cold. So when you warm up a solution, right, if you have add sugar to water and they tell you how can you keep adding more sugar to water and get it to dissolve, 
you heat up the solution. So if we keep it cold, again, it inhibits uh, the DNA from dissolving in solution. So both of those things, the fact that it's very, very cold and the wash buffer is made up primarily of ethanol will keep the DNA bound to the disc through those salt bridges, okay? Okay, so this has been sitting here in my tube for about a minute or so. So the next thing that I want to do is open up my tube and I just want to, <coughs> excuse me, I want to air dry my disc. So to do that, I'm gonna take again another pipette tip. If you've been using a tweezer up until now, uh, this point you do not want to use the tweezer anymore. You do want to use a pipette tip because the tweezer that you would have been using is going to have cellular debris on it. And we wanna make sure that we now keep this disc that should be purified Okay, clean of all of that cellular debris. We won't, don't want to put it back onto the disc. So make sure you're using a pipette tip at this point. So we're just going to take my disc that's sitting along the bottom of the tube here, and we're going to drag it up the side of the tube, as you can see here. Okay, and I'm just going to let it sit at the top, and I'm going to keep my tube open here with my disc sitting inside of it, and we're just going to let that air dry. So make sure when you're doing this that you keep the cap of the tube open. If you keep it closed, the ethanol won't be able to evaporate. Now there is some water inside of my wash buffer as well. So if the disc is still a little bit damp after one or two minutes of it sitting, that's okay. We just wanna make sure the ethanol is evaporated off and the ethanol evaporates off pretty quickly. So as I mentioned before, while we're waiting for this to evaporate, uh, there are a number of different types of DNA isolations that we can do. We're using today a rapid DNA isolation method, and this works really well for a broad number of organisms, but especially plants. And we have about 60% about efficiency with getting isolated DNA from invertebrates as well. But there are a number of different techniques out there. So there are commercially available kits that especially are very good for maybe processed samples or for trying to isolate DNA from blood or for other difficult samples, maybe something that has a really tough exoskeleton or try to get it from hair. Um, we here at the DNA Learning Center use another protocol called the silica DNA isolation method. So it's a little bit longer than the rapid DNA isolation method that I'm showing to you today. But this method um, works for an even, for an even broader number of organisms compared to the rapid because it involves things like heat and has a few more purification procedures behind it. If you're interested in doing this type of DNA isolation, we actually have a collaboration with the company Carolina Biological. And I have the website at the end of my uh, talk here that I can show you where if you're interested in purchasing the kit, you can do the silica DNA isolation um, yourself. Okay, so this is about done air drying. So we're gonna give it just another moment. So I'm gonna set up my final tube for my reaction. And that is my TE buffer tube. So TE buffer is basically mostly water, but it has a little bit of Tris and EDTA in it. And what those are used for, it's to stabilize DNA. So what it allows us to do is to create a stock of our DNA solution that we can keep for a long period of time, especially if we freeze the DNA. So we're going to use this to, to remove the DNA from off of the Wattman disk and into the solution. So why are we able to do that? Well, remember, the, disk is, the DNA is bound through these salt bridges and the wash buffer did not remove the DNA because it had the high ethanol concentration and because it was very cold. Well, my TE has been sitting here at ambient temperature, at room temperature, and also, like I said, it's got a large percentage of water in it. So when we add our disc into the TE buffer solution, we're going to dilute out those ions and those electrostatic interactions that are binding the DNA to the disc. We're gonna dilute those out, which is going to remove or elute the DNA off of the disc. So we will let our disc sit in our TE buffer and the longer we let it sit, the more DNA we'll be able to remove from our disc. So we're going to go ahead and set up our TE tube here, okay? Okay, so, whoop. so we are going to add 30 microliters of tea into my tube. So we're going to go back to my yellow pipette now. I'm going to set this for 0300. Okay, and I'm going to draw up my TE buffer again to the first stop place the pipette tip into the tube, slowly draw up my 30 microliters of sample, transfer the buffer into my TE tube. Okay. And our last step now is to take 
our tube here that has been, or disc here, I should say, that's been air drying and transferred into our TE buffer. So same as we did before when we dragged the disc up out of the side of the tube, we're going to now use a pipette tip to transfer this disc into the final tube. So again, holding the tube on an angle here, I'm just going to slowly transfer this disc directly into my TE. So I can push it down in there with the pipette tip. And once it's inside of the TE, you just want to give it kind of a gentle flick. You really want to make sure that disc is fully submerged. And we'll let this sit here at room temperature, at ambient temperature, for about 15 minutes so that we can elute most of the DNA off the disc. And we've let this sit for probably up to about 24 hours, so about 15 minutes at room temperature, and then we put it at 4 degrees Celsius in the fridge uh, for about 24 hours. And we found that seems to be the maximum amount of time that you need to elute all of the DNA. Though after between 15 minutes and 24 hours, there's not a huge difference, but you'll get a little bit more DNA. So now what we're going to have is a stock solution of DNA that we can now target and amplify the DNA barcoding region using polymerase chain reaction, which I mentioned earlier. So in our next uh, session, we'll be using PCR to amplify DNA from my plant, and I'll finish up the DNA isolation from my invertebrate sample as well. So we'll amplify it, we'll confirm the amplification with gel electrophoresis, and then in our final set, we'll be talking about DNA sequencing. So how does this information get sequenced, and how do we identify the species? So I hope you've had a lot of fun. I've had a lot of fun today. Remember to follow us um, on Instagram, follow us on Facebook if you want to learn more about our DNALC live events. The website's up here for the DNA Learning Center and for our DNA Learning Center live page. And I've also included the uh, website to Carolina Biological. And if you're interested in finding our silica DNA isolation protocol, just go ahead and search Carolina for using DNA barcodes to identify and class classify living things, and you'll find our kits. So... I hope you had fun, and I hope to see you at our next session. Have a good day.